Now, you've likely heard a lot about uh, the TCS on other sessions, so I'll focus really uh, strictly on e-commerce. Um, since 2019, the TCS um, has expanded the services that we offer to e-commerce SMEs, focusing our work mainly on helping Canadian companies access an online channel um, to connect uh, with the right e-commerce players in Canada and in market, uh, such as Shopify, such as Amazon. Uh, help to increase the category of Canadian products on targeted platforms, uh, helping to build awareness of Canadian brands in the EU, and helping Canadian companies maybe um, most importantly to address uh, some of the key market intelligence gaps in the e-commerce ecosystem in EU markets, and that's where our trade commissioners will be able to expand on that. Um, our goal really is to help open the door to companies like yours to e-commerce opportunities, especially at this time when getting online and exporting is becoming particularly critical to Canadian companies. Um, if we can go to my second slide, um, which was on can export SMEs. Yeah, so the next, the next slide, please. Thank you. One of those critical TCS tools is Can Export, which you may have heard about in previous panels. Uh, it's a funding program for Canadian SMEs. So Canadian e-commerce companies can now access up to 75,000 in funding to cover up to 75% of your international market development activities, such as help with market research, um, participation at virtual trade events and fairs, uh, the adaptation and translation of marketing tools, IP protection and certification, and adaptation of contracts, um, and expert advice on, on business, legal, or tax matters, obviously, all of which are critical in the EU. Um, since COVID, uh, Can Export SMEs has adapted its services and introduced new measures to support Canadian businesses to navigate these current challenges. Um, so the maximum funding for online advertising activities, <clears throat> including search engine optimization, um, has been increased to 50000 per project. Uh, the program is now allowing online advertising on social media platforms, online marketplaces and search engines, as I mentioned, and funding for expert advisors for digital and e-commerce marketing uh, activities is, is now eligible as well. So I really encourage you to apply for this funding. Uh, for more information on this, go to tradecommissioner.gc.ca and you'll see the Can Export link in our um, featured section. Next slide. So very briefly, before I pass things on to my colleagues in, in Brussels and Munich and to uh, BDC, I just, you know, the, the EU e-commerce market is growing quickly and it really represents uh, uh, what we think a huge opportunity for Canadian retailers. Uh, in fact, e-commerce, to probably no one's surprise, is the fastest growing segment in retail um, in the EU. And while more than, you know, 65% of EU trade is with other EU countries, this trend really is changing and there are huge opportunities for Canadian companies. Uh, large swaths of shoppers in many EU countries are purchasing from non-EU sellers and this, this trend is growing. A few, a few tips before we get into it. Preparation is key. You know, uh, contacting your, your regional office, your TCS regional office in Canada uh, for, for assistance uh, early on is critical. Partners are essential. An importer of record will likely be critical. Uh, regulations, standards, and certifications can be stringent in spite of CETA, and this is where my colleague Elianal will, will uh, speak a little bit on that. Frequent visits are necessary. EU is a, is a relationship market like many others, and of course it's highly competitive. We'll be trying to take away market share from really well-entrenched companies. So on that note, I'm going to pass things over to my colleague Elianal Faget, Trade Commissioner in Brussels. Elianal, the floor is yours. Thanks for the introduction, Michael. And good afternoon, everyone. So my goal today is to provide an overview of the EU e-commerce market. I will show you that there are opportunities for Canadian exporters, but also a number of challenges that you should be aware of. Um, so for my first slide, can I, can next slide, please? Thank you. So um, for my first slide, I will um, need everybody to, to bear with me because I will use some data. So as you can see, there are multiple indicators showing that the EU is an attractive market for e-commerce. Here I have selected three, uh, internet penetration, the number of e-shoppers and e-GDP, that's the share of GDP made up by e-commerce sales. And all those indicators have been growing over the past years in all EU member states and projection shows that this will continue. So um, if we look more specifically at the number of e-shoppers, 
they were only 63% in 2014, and they are now 71% in 2019. And the expectation is that this number will keep growing. So here, the key message is really that there are consumers in Europe that have trust in e-commerce, as well as money, and they shop willingly online. So um, next slide, please. So what, what does it mean for, for Canadian exporters? Well, um, it's quite positive. Here you can see that uh, there is an increase in the number of uh, EU consumers that buy products from non-EU sellers. Uh, so from 18% in 2014 to 28% in 2019. And something that is quite inter interesting is that this increase was comparatively stronger than for national sellers and sellers from other EU countries. So now the obvious question um, is, so what was the impact of COVID-19? So the most immediate problems were related to the disruption of supply chains. Uh, that was a direct consequence of the increased border controls. But recent data do show that things uh, went back to normal within the EU. Uh, the second main effect uh, was that sectors were unequally affected. Sectors that benefited the most from the outbreak were healthcare, groceries, and consumer electronics. On the contrary, sectors that suffered the most are fashion, tourism, travel, and the event industry. Um, there are also data indicating that the transition to online shopping is here to stay. So according to a recent study from RetailX, um, a lot of consumers who started to shop online during the COVID-19 crisis intend to continue to do so in the future. So this is a, a very positive trend. And um, it notably concerns all the people that are traditionally less likely to shop online. And that also means that there will be a, a larger consumer base for, for Canadian exporters in the future. So quite a positive trend. Um, the fourth key trend emerging from the pandemic, uh, so that's my, my, my fourth bullet point, um, is that consumers intend to continue to buy locally rather than just for marketplaces. Uh, well, why? The main reason is to obviously support local shops. So something to, to keep in mind. Um, next slide, please. So this map, um, I hope, will make you understand that um, it's very important to undertake in-depth market research. It really shows that uh, the EU is a diverse market. So if we just use one indicator, that's the proportion of e-shoppers, we can see that it varies quite a lot from one member state to another. So uh, in Italy, it, there are 48%. In, in Sweden, it's 84%. Um, so quite a big difference um, from one member state to another. Uh, we can also identify certain regional trends. So Scandinavian countries score high in important e-commerce indicators, and they also have the highest rate of internet penetration. But it's very clear that uh, Western Europe is in the lead. So that's UK, France, and Germany. Uh, they remain by far the biggest e-commerce markets, both in terms of e-shoppers and B2C e-commerce turnover. And that's obviously also due to the fact that they are the three most populated countries in the EU. Eastern and Southern Europe, uh, in comparison, are growing markets but they are also probably less saturated than the ones in Northern or Western Europe. And um, our experience shows that Canadian exporters are more reluctant to explore these markets, but the opportunities there are definitely on the rise. So here, my, my key message is really that there is no one size fits all strategy for the whole EU market. So as an exporter, you really need to adapt your strategy to each of your target market. Next slide, please. So another way to assess um, how diverse uh, the EU is, um, is to look at customers' preferences. So here there are two graphs on the delivery methods. So they showed that uh, Belgian and Norwegians have um, perfectly opposite preferences for delivery methods. So in Belgium, there is an overwhelming preference for home delivery, while in Norway, consumers prefer to use pickup points. And actually, that's only one example. There are many other preferences to take into consideration. So for payment methods, for example, in France, the great majority of online shoppers prefer to pay directly with their credit cards. And that's also the case in the UK. Whereas in Italy, PayPal or other related systems are way more popular. Another example, privacy concerns. Um, it's five times more important for French than for Bulgarian consumers. Uh, same thing for sustainability. Consumer in Norway will be willing to pay more money for sustainable product or less packaging, but that's not necessarily the case in Romania. Uh, 
So the bottom line here again is that it's really important to, to know your audience, to understand what potential clients expect in each member state and to, to adapt to the, to the specificities of the local market. Next slide, please. So marketplaces uh, are a good entry strategy. It's a great place to gain visibility. They also have some, some drawbacks, and that's something that my, my colleague Julia Pratt uh, will explain in, in greater details when she talks about the, the German e-commerce market. But what we can see at the European level is that um, Amazon remains a leader on numerous markets, uh, but there is not only Amazon. So you really need to take a look at the competition, especially the local one. So here we can see that Bold.com is very popular in Belgium or the Netherlands, far more than Amazon. Um, and France is also a good example. So Amazon only has around 20% of the market share on, uh, on the e-commerce market there. So they really managed to create a, a diversified market. And uh, another example of uh, the fact that Amazon is not the ultimate leader is that in Eastern European countries, AliExpress is very popular. Uh, more than Amazon, um, this is the case for Bulgaria or Serbia, for example. So it's really important that you take the time to look at other marketplaces than Amazon. Next slide, please. So this is a, a short list of the most common challenges encountered by Canadian companies when they export via e-commerce. So first, fulfillment. So there are different solutions. Some marketplaces include that in their business package, such as Amazon. Uh, there are also third-party logistics providers that assist you. So there are really different types of solutions, but it's important that you prepare well. And keep in mind that once your product is in the EU, it can circulate freely from one member state to another. That's one of the key advantages of the EU single market, actually. That's the freedom of movement of goods. So you can store your goods in one country and sell them in another EU country. Uh, then on VAT, um, here's something important to note is that a reform is uh, upcoming at the EU level uh, that actually aims to boost and uh, facilitate cross-border e-commerce. It will enter into force in uh, 2021. So two of its key provisions is that first, it will allow organizations to uh, register VAT in one country and not several EU countries uh, as it can currently be the case. And it also eliminates VAT exemptions for goods that are worth less than 22 euros. So something to, to keep in mind if you already export to the EU and um, or you're already familiar with VAT, that there is change upcoming. Um, language, so it's important that you present information on your products in the native language of the target market. Uh, there is a diversity of languages in the EU. Actually, there are 23 official languages. So if you want to, to sell to a consumer, you need to use uh, his language. So that's, that's very important. Another uh, key point is that strong marketing strategy is, uh, is, is essential, especially if you're aiming for a market that is already quite saturated, such as France, the UK or Germany. And uh, those are actually the main destinations for Canadian exporters. And finally, the ability to uh, accept payment in local currency is also extremely important. Um, why? Because this will also allow customers to compare prices more easily. So keep in mind that the euro is not used in all EU member states. Um, of course, the most obvious example is the UK, uh, soon leaving the EU, but there is also Poland or Czech Republic, for example, that have different currencies. Next slide, please. So um, something very important and also another challenge um, is that the EU is a very regulated market, more than the US. And uh, here is a selection of regulations with which you, you may need to comply as an exporter. I will go quickly through some of them, but I would be happy to, to answer more specific questions during the, the Q&A session as well. So um, one thing to keep in mind is that EU law has a strong focus on consumer protection, which is also deeply interlinked with the rules on online contracting. So online shoppers are well protected in the EU and they have considerable rights. Just to give you three examples, um, consumers have a 14-day withdrawal right, uh, printed boxes on websites for charging extra payments are not allowed, so charges for the use of credit cards and telephone hotlines are also not permitted. Um, then there is also the, the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, or GDPR, maybe this, this acronym is already familiar to you. So the GDPR imposes a considerable number of obligations on Canadian companies that process the personal data of European individuals. And this is something you're very likely to do if you set up your own online website and target EU consumers. 
So some of the obligations you may need to comply with under the, the GDPR are, for example, um, appointing a data protection officer in your company and a representative in the EU. You may also need to keep a record of your data processing activities uh, and most likely you will need to update your privacy policy. So complying with the GDPR is a burdensome process, so you should really prepare for it. Um, there is also a directive on geoblocking and geodiscrimination. So that applies to all traders, whether they are based in the EU or not. So typically it would apply to a Canadian company exporting to the EU. Um, a very concrete example, if you set up your own online shop and you accept payments uh, from a specific brand of credit card, you will need to accept payments that are made from all member states with this brand of credit cards and not only accept payments from Germany, for example. In the case of online services, uh, there are also specific rules related to online portability. So for example, if you sell ebooks, you will need to ensure that your citizens can use them in all EU member states when they travel temporarily, for example, if they're on holidays. Um, beyond all the rules that are in the colorful hexagons, and actually they concern mostly companies that create uh, their own standalone website. There are also all the, the regulation and the rules related to the traditional side of exporting. So that's VAT that I already mentioned, customs, labeling, marking, and product safety. Next slide, please. So um, all these regulations that I mentioned may seem a bit uh, overwhelming, but um, so here to, to help you, there is a, a short checklist um, that can help you approach the EU regulatory framework and identify what obligations apply to you. So first, at the EU level, um, you will need to assess what type of legislation you need to comply with. So that will depend on different factors. So whether you um, use a marketplace or standalone website, the type of products and services that you sell, whether you have an establishment in the EU. So it can be quite difficult to assess what type of legislation apply to you. So don't hesitate to contact the Brussels office of the Trade Commission Service. This is where I'm based. And this is typically, typically sorry, the kind of questions that we can um, help you with. Um, looking at the EU legislation is not enough. You also need to, to, to look at uh, national legislation. Here, um, don't hesitate to contact trade commissioners in local markets, so in member states. They can put you in touch with lawyers or accountants that can help you. And finally, uh, CETA, so the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement that was uh, concluded between the EU and Canada three years ago, and that's the, the reason why we're here today, to, to celebrate this anniversary. So um, it gives Canadian companies the preferential access to the EU market. So just to, to give you an example that is more relevant for e-commerce, uh, CETA eliminates or reduces custom duties for 98% of current tariff lines that concerns agricultural products, cosmetics, perfumes, etc. And that, what that means concretely is that for certain products, you won't have to pay a tariff at the EU border. Something to keep in mind, because it's quite a common mistake, custom duties and VAT are two different things. So even if you don't need to pay custom duties, thanks to CETA, you will still need to deal with VAT. Um, I'll stop here. Uh, next up is uh, Julia Pracht, who will tell you more about the German e-commerce market. Thanks, Aliena. Uh, and uh, as you said, over to you, Julia. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, good afternoon from my side as well. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so I'll be talking about Germany as a market today, a little bit about strategies and also about challenges. <clears throat> um, next slide, please. So here's a little map of Germany, um, right smack in the middle of Europe. And straight on to the next slide, please. So Germany is the most populous country in the European Union. It's got a population of about 83 million people. Um, it's also always had a strong economy and high purchasing power. Uh, we have about 95% internet penetration and about 85% of the population shop online. Sustainability is a big issue with us um, these days at least, um, but unfortunately also due to COVID, we're currently in a recession. Next slide, please. Um, I'll skip this one, German consumer, um, in the interest of time, just to say we're um, difficult, but if we like your brand, eventually um, we're usually very loyal. Next slide, please. Um, so a little bit about the e-commerce status quo right now. Um, the projected uh, turnover in B2C e-commerce for physical goods only for this year is about 127 billion Canadian dollars. 
um, more than 50% of this e-commerce turnover is generated on marketplaces in Germany. The top categories have uh, traditionally been home electronics, clothing and footwear, books and CDs and DVDs. Um, and one thing to note maybe is that um, uh, it's probably a little less now than two thirds of German retailers, but still a large number, more than 50% who do not have their own web shop. These are very small um, stores. Next slide, please. Um, the digital mindset is still quite underdeveloped in Germany uh, when compared to other European countries, but also due to COVID um, in recent months, we've been seeing much more frequent online shopping, online purchases of everyday items, so groceries, pet items, personal care, um, a strong shift towards mobile commerce um, and a rise in com conversational commerce. Next slide, please. So next uh, topic is strategy, and uh, we can move right on to the next slide. Big question is, should you sell via a marketplace or um, operate your own standalone web shop? And this is a very important strategic decision. I would suggest uh, that you consider a variety of factors, such as what are you trying to achieve and uh, how do you want to do business in Germany? What products are you going to offer in the market? What are your expected sales? Do you think you will sell 10 units per year or per minute? How much of an investment are you willing and able to make? Are you looking to perhaps set up a company in Germany and run it? And how are you going to handle fulfillment? Next slide, please. Just looking at marketplaces now, um, as already mentioned, they generate more than 50% of the e-commerce turnover in Germany. The sector is very dynamic and has um, grown very strongly over the past five years. There are currently um, over 170 marketplaces in the DACH region, that's uh, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and they're a mix of international and homegrown marketplaces. <clears throat> so we obviously have Amazon. Oh, sorry, this has actually gone too far. Can we go one back, please? Thank you. No. Okay, maybe maybe one slide has lost has been lost. Sorry. Um, so I'm just going to con continue where I um, stopped. So we have Amazon and eBay as marketplaces, and um, they're often used by German retailers that don't have their own web shops. Um, and they also use Instagram and Facebook shopping features. Uh, some marketplaces are operated by well-known retailers, such as Otto, Douglas, Bräuninger, or Galeria. But we also have a lot of specialized or niche marketplaces, such as Zalando, the Avocado Store, or Wonderfurs. So getting to this slide now <clears throat> that you see on the screen right now. Um, the problem with most of these marketplaces is that you can't just sign up and start selling because they quite often select their sellers very carefully. And they only accept brands that are already known in the market and that complement their own portfolio. So Otto, for instance, is very clear about this. And Zalando is invitation only. Um, <clears throat> marketplaces also often require sellers to have a German company fulfill from a German warehouse and offers customer service in German. And this means that among the large marketplaces, unless you're planning to set up a German operation, um, Amazon and eBay may very well be your only choices. Um, alternatively, of course, you can um, look at some of the smaller uh, niche marketplaces that quite often do accept sellers from abroad if the um, product is a good fit. Next slide, please. So um, the general problem with marketplaces, uh, as has already mentioned, been mentioned, is that they're highly competitive because there are so many sellers there. Um, this means your sales will typically be lower and your return rates higher. You will have uh, little to no access to customer data, which is, of course, a strong disadvantage in today's data-driven economy. And selling in a marketplace is a full-time job that needs a strong strategy, especially regarding uh, product selection, logistics, and marketing but they're the best place to gain visibility and they typically have solutions or partners for everything, including fulfillment, payment, and taxes. Next slide, please. Um, so should you run your own web shop instead? Could be very tempting, but I would suggest that you consider a variety of, of issues. First of all, um, think about the German consumer and ask yourself whether you can set up an independent operation that will meet um, customer expectations and that will be able to compete with what other um, retailers have in place already. 
<clears throat> if the answer is yes, then you need to decide, are you going to operate a Canadian or a German website? Germans prefer buying from a .de website, um, but that comes with its own legal requirements. I'll go into that in a second. Um, how are you going to handle warehousing and fulfillment? How are you going to do marketing? And how are you going to cope with the regulation that uh, Alienor just mentioned? Next slide, please. So very, very quickly, um, operating a .de website, yes, you can, you can get one as a Canadian. Um, you must meet all the requirements that apply to owners of such websites. Um, for instance, we have this thing that's called the Impressum, which is a total must, and it's like your online business card. People tend to forget it very easily. The, German, uh, the general terms and conditions must meet strict requirements. Like Alienor <clears throat> already mentioned, you cannot have unjustified geo-blocking or geo-discrimination. Um, and we have um, private uh, enforcement of e-commerce regulation here, and the fines can run to the tens of thousands of euros. So this is really to be taken seriously. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Just summing up some of the other issues that could occur. Next slide, please. So the German market is very big, but it's also very difficult to break into. And we typically advise our clients to allow to five years. Um, please keep in mind, not every product is going to work here. Um, and even if you have a great product, you can totally kill its chances by running a website or a shop or an Amazon page that's got poor German or content that's not relevant to the market. Um, Alienor has talked about regulation. I can only encourage you to take that very seriously and also look at the national um, legislation. Um, importation, customs, logistics, taxes, huge issues, marketplace requirements, like I just mentioned. And uh, finally, of course, sustainability, both of the product and of your market strategy. Next slide, please. Um, therefore, my main advice for you is to prepare. Um, do lots of market research, build a market strategy based on that. Um, if you're looking at various EU markets, you need a separate strategy for every market. Um, look at the different channels and platforms to determine which one is best for you. Uh, research all the admin, the shipping, customs, taxes, um, and build a marketing strategy. Uh, otherwise, nobody will see you and nobody will buy from you. And it's going to cost you a lot of time and money, but not as much as a failed market entry. Um, next slide, please. These are just some sources of further information for further reading, um, some pretty good reports, uh, blog entries, um, graphs, uh, quite insightful. And with this, I close and I am looking forward to uh, questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Julia. Um, that's great. Uh, we have a few questions here that we'll get to. Um, I'd like to introduce now Ricardo Pereira. Uh, with the BDC since 2016, uh, Ricardo is currently the Manager of International Partnerships responsible for enhancing um, SME internationalization with partners like EDC and the Trade Commission Service. As part of his 20-year career in international business and finance, Ricardo was Deputy Director and Trade Commissioner for Switzerland Global Enterprise in Brazil for over 10 years, where he was responsible for export and trade of hundreds of Swiss companies in that market. Uh, he's also been an entrepreneur providing innovative business financing solutions to SMEs and has a Bachelor of International Business from the John Molson School of Business at Concordia. Ricardo, thanks very much. So thank you so much, uh, Michael, merci, uh, and uh, many thanks to, to the Trade Commissioner Service, I mean, for the, uh, this great opportunity today. So, so I'm, I'm really delighted uh, to, give you, to give you all uh, an overview regarding the, the rise of e-commerce and some related uh, tips and trends that will really, uh, you know, hopefully uh, shed some light. I mean, as you're as you're thinking about pursuing or growing your e-commerce business uh, in the, in the European market. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, go, sorry. Go back. Uh, go back one, please. Thank you. So, um, so yeah, it's been a, it's been really uh, you know uh, hasn't been easy for entrepreneurs uh, at all. I mean, with the lockdowns, uh, you know, from the COVID, uh, you know, has uh, has hit many businesses really hard, uh, which has caused uh, sharp uh, revenue drops and unexpected expenses. Uh, clearly, so you know now more than ever, companies really need to focus on uh, operating you know as efficiently and productively as as possible. 
So, so at BDC, I mean, we, we think that digital technology should be a key driver to, you know, getting your business back on track and position for, for future growth domestically and internationally. So for the next uh, eight to 10 minutes, I'm just going to provide uh, an overview on, on the rise of e-commerce by sharing, you know, some highlights of a, a BDC new study on e-commerce that was just released last week and how you can really harness um, uh, the, the, uh, how you can harness this to create a leaner, more productive and more profitable uh, business uh, by putting uh, your customers, you know, at the center of the, the online experience. Next slide, please. So, so just, uh, I mean, just uh, um, to, to give you some initial context on the trend of e-commerce uh, and its boom uh, that began long before the pandemic in Canada, which, which, which grew by almost threefold, uh, reaching uh, 22 billion in, in 2018 within just a six, uh, six year period. So since, since the pandemic began, uh, every single month, uh, you know, between April and September of this year, uh, Canadian uh, e-commerce sales surpassed you know, $2.9 billion every single month. So ju just to give you a, a sense of what that volume uh, is, I mean, this is higher, like every single month this year, this is higher than the, the e-commerce sales level of Christmas uh, of 2019. Next slide, please. So just, just a few highlights of, uh, of the new BDC study uh, called uh, Profit from, from e-commerce, uh, which was just released last week. Uh, and by the way, uh, the, the full study is, uh, is available uh, free uh, at bdc.ca. So, uh, e I mean, e-commerce is, uh, is a must for, for many, many businesses. Um, you know, the global uh, e-commerce market uh, is expected to reach, you know, $39 trillion within the next three years. Um, incredibly, 85% uh, of Canadian consumers uh, are buying online. And um, according to, to a poll that uh, BDC conducted uh, in the summer, Eight out, eight out of 10 Canadians uh, who made a, an online purchase uh, for the first time during the pandemic uh, do intend to continue shopping uh, online after the crisis. And, and I believe, you know, uh, this trend is uh, no different uh, in places uh, like Europe, like my colleagues were, were explaining uh, how fast that the market is growing. Uh, nearly 80% of businesses active um, online saw sales increase even before the pandemic. But on the other hand, uh, you know, too many entrepreneurs um, are really slow uh, to making that shift. So only 46% of SMEs uh, are planning to sell online after the crisis. And believe it or not, I mean, fewer than 25% will prioritize e-commerce in the next year. So this is, a, this is really a, a concern. Next slide, please. So having a strong online presence, uh, you know, not only drives uh, growth, but it really supports operations to be more more efficient, whether it's to fulfill a domestic or an international demand. Um, our study uh, also found that the businesses uh, that are active online have higher profits um, and sales growth, as well as they, uh, they export more than similar businesses that do not sell online. Um, and, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, businesses uh, that are active online are 2.8 times more likely to serve international markets. Next slide, please. So for, for, uh, for businesses uh, selling online, um, I think I might've skipped one slide. So for, for, uh, for businesses uh, that, are, that are selling or planning to sell domestically or internationally, I mean, I just, I just wanted to, uh, to share like another you know, key finding um, that our study of our study around the top challenges businesses are facing uh, when selling online. So, you know, providing a, a good customer experience was the top challenge mentioned by almost 50% of the respondents. Other important ones um, were related to, uh, to having the right skills uh, and expertise, uh, ensure, uh, you know, obviously the, uh, the, uh, the, the platform uh, is, is uh, profitable, uh, that on-time delivery is, uh, is taking place uh, and obtaining financing was also uh, mentioned on, on that list. Next slide, please. Again, almost half of businesses uh, who are selling online said that providing a good customer experience is a challenge. But uh, why, why is that? I mean, I just want to give you a, a brief, uh, brief insight. So, you know, the loss of the face-to-face -face customer relationship can, can uh, really make it hard uh, to provide uh, the, the attention and 
and the personalized services that that you know uh, that businesses are, are providing uh, outside of uh, the the e-commerce uh, side of things. Um, I mean, it's really difficult to uh, to compete uh, with the delivery and and you know uh, delivery speed and seamless transactions uh, of the of the e-commerce uh, giants like Amazon, for example. Some some complex products or services, um, you know, they, they still require Salesforce uh, to support, uh, which you know can be difficult to uh, to offer online. And some other products uh, they need to be tried before uh, you know being being purchased, uh, you know, online, which makes a little bit customers hesitating uh, during the buying process. Uh, next slide, please. So, so in essence, uh, you know, what was expected to happen uh, regarding digital technology and e-commerce in five, 10 years is really happening now. Um, not only has e-commerce uh, become part of uh, daily Canadian lives, but it also part of the daily lives of, of Americans and, and Europeans, for example. And so how, how, you, set it, how you set it up and, and do it profitably is, uh, is key to selling online uh, internationally uh, and successfully. Next slide, please. So certainly doing business online requires a, a different approach, uh, especially if you're trying to tap into this $39 trillion, the fast growing global e-commerce market, or, or the fast approaching a $600 billion market in Europe, uh, as Michael uh, was mentioning uh, in the beginning. And it, you know, it's also important to, to create an on online marketing uh, strategy that will, will help you understand your customers better, especially those uh, in the diverse European countries, uh, like my, uh, my panelists were, were talking about earlier, and also to build uh, loyalty. So uh, one key to success is really understanding your customer's experience um, to make the buying process uh, you know, as smooth as possible. Next slide, please. So you know, briefly, uh, putting customers uh, you know, wherever they are around the world and their personas uh, you know, at the center of the online experience is, is uh, really the secret uh, to online sales success. Next slide, please. So in that, in that regard, I mean, just, I just wanted to quickly uh, you know, uh, share these five steps uh, to, to a better online customer experience uh, you know, to support your domestic and international expansion efforts. So you know, define your target market. Uh, you know, perhaps start with the market scan to to understand the landscape and the competition. Um, understanding of your customer uh, by creating your personas and mapping out uh, their their journey. Um, optimizing uh, the website uh, by creating the right content at the right moment. Um, you have to make it easier for for clients to navigate, which which includes you know a strong call to action. Uh, adapt your marketing. Um, you know, to, to make your brand successful. I mean, it's a combination of what you say and, and how you say it, uh, especially uh, given the differences uh, in, uh, in international markets. Um, and I mean, very important measure and optimize, you know, take time to set up your, your analytics, uh, you know, continual mining of, uh, of the insights uh, to improve uh, the customer experience and, and confirm that uh, the funnel is uh, of, uh, of your uh, potential customers are working well. Next slide, please. So I mean, J Jeff Bezos uh, says says it often that uh, I mean the reason Amazon has done uh, better than most peers uh, in the internet space uh, is because you know they have focused you know like a laser on on customer experience and and this is really key. Next slide, please. So just coming to an end, I just uh, wanted to to share a quick story uh, of a business uh, that had to make changes uh, to adapt uh, to the pandemic which resulted in, in tremendous uh, e-commerce uh, traction, particularly uh, in international markets. So this, uh, this Vancouver-based uh, Nomino uh, sells athletic uh, leisure wear uh, that is based on uh, the original artwork uh, created by, uh, by the founder's uh, late mother, uh, or also from, from uh, commissioned uh, work by indigenous uh, Canadian and international artists. So it, it, there's really, a, really an interesting uh, niche here. So her retail and wholesale business uh, were, were top performance, uh, you know, not the online business until the pandemic uh, hit. Um, you know, the, the essential, uh, the, the, it was really essential for the company to, to pivot, um, uh, allowing them to grow, you know, exports. And, and uh, you know, they're seeing a lot of interest uh, from, uh, from Germany specifically. So, you know, what, what happened uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, they, the company uh, did some, some aggressive online marketing campaigns and offered some promotions. Um, you know, the online sales went uh, went through the roof. Um, the company 
took the budget that originally they they were setting aside for trade shows and, and redirecting to uh, to online marketing uh, completely. So, um, so uh, you know, the company has found a, a new international audience uh, for its uh, distinctively Canadian uh, apparel. Uh, so, so their you know their international e-commerce sales have tripled. Uh, you know, receiving orders from places like uh, Australia and uh, and London and, and Dubai. Um, so for this company, uh, for example, I mean, it was key for them to identify, so they identified a, a niche and, and adapted very quickly. So, you know, her company started to see more and larger orders coming from, from the U.S. and Europe as well. And, you know, following that success uh, overseas uh, during the pandemic, uh, she decided to, to launch an e-commerce platform uh, based in Germany. And why did she do that? I mean, she discovered that uh, the German customers uh, really love uh, her, her product, which is locally made uh, uh, in, in environmentally uh, friendly, friendly clothing. So adaptability was really key for, for, for this business uh, to, to, you know, to, to gain traction, uh, not only in commerce in Canada, but also internationally. Next slide, please. So, you know, last, uh, last point, uh, how, you know, how, um, how can BDC, um, you know, help uh, help uh, your 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 business. So we, we you know BDC provides uh, you know financing and, and advisory. Uh, we have a number of uh, different uh, solutions that uh, we we can help uh, uh, your business with. Um, I mean, on the uh, on the advisory on the advisory side, for for example, uh, you know we have solutions uh, such as selling online uh, to help uh, help the company launch and sustain a profitable e-commerce platform. Uh, online sales optimization, uh, uh, for instance, or a website power to to help build a new custom build uh, website uh, to the right uh, with the right vendor, um, or even more advanced uh, digital technology solutions like an ERP system selection and implementation. So we're it's very uh, it's very uh, it's a big pleasure for us to to work uh, side by side with the Trade Commission of Service uh, as you you know pursue your international uh, uh, you know initial international growth or expansion plans. Next slide, please. So thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Michael. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, we've got three questions. Um, and Ricardo, two of them are for you. So I'll let you catch your breath for a second. Um, and I'll go to, um, to Julia and to Elinor on this one. Uh, great question from Gina Power. For Germany, should books and websites be in the local language? Do they buy in English? I know that you addressed this a little bit before, Julia, um, but can that, can, do, do consumers not buy English at all? What are the risks of an English website in Germany? Well, basically, um, most people speak English in Germany, but that doesn't mean they're going to buy from um, a, a non-German website. So if we do our shopping in, German, in Germany, we basically expect a German website. Um, if we do a targeted search for um, somebody outside of Germany and we're familiar with the country and we're comfortable with taking the risk, basically, then we might go for something in English. But um, I would say you're more likely to catch German customers if you offer your website in German. Okay. And, and you know, from your perspective in, um, in Belgium. Well, maybe I can I can talk about uh, the EU more broadly. Actually, mm -hmm. we see that there are different sensitivities in Europe regarding languages. Um, I think the overall recommendation is that you should at least translate the main pages of your website or the key description of your products should be in the language, the, the language of the local market. But we see that there is a difference, for example, uh, in France. It's very important that you speak in French to French people to sell products there. In the Netherlands, for example, Dutch people um, speak better English, so it won't necessarily be a problem if you talk to them in English. So again, here it's about market research and uh, really like knowing your customer. Okay, thank you. Ricardo, this is for you. How can I assess if an e-commerce strategy is right for my type of business to maximize my chance of success? That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, so, I mean, you know, on, the online success uh, does, does require Required uh, like a structured uh, approach um, adapted to the reality of uh, of, uh, of the business. You know, I mean, no matter what stage of the the process uh, the company is at, uh, you know, I think uh, like an e-commerce roadmap or like a digital uh, 
digital strategy like roadmap will help uh, the company successfully you know launch their 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 business or grow their business so you know like a roadmap uh, could be uh, for instance from from understanding the online sales in the sector to you know getting to know the customers uh, and their their preferences uh, like i mentioned uh, review the review the relationship uh, with uh, with your business partners uh, and and your business model specifically. Um, obviously, uh, developing the new skills internally is very important for that sustainability. And you know, define defining the sales objective and and really optimize the the, the efforts online to make sure that the, the business is uh, is uh, you know has is is well known and is like top of mind basically because there's so much out there uh, online these days. Okay. Um, is there, in fact, is there a way to find out how, um, you know, how a particular company is doing with its digital strategy? You mentioned digital strategy vis-a-vis -vis other companies. I mean, all three of you talked about the importance of market research and understanding it. Um, mm -hmm. Ricardo, from your perspective, is, is, is there a way to find this out? Oh, that's a very, very interesting question. Uh, so, so in fact, on the, so I, I'm going to suggest that the uh, you know the uh, the BDC this, this new BDC study uh, that talks about uh, the e-commerce uh, there is um, there's an, an element there that I mean obviously you can find it on at BDC.ca so there there's what we call it uh, a digital maturity uh, level so so there's a there's a free self-assessment tool uh, for, as a matter of fact that that uh, that we that companies can use uh, you know basically. To, to compare themselves where where they're at you know like well how, how do we how do we define digital maturity for example you know so basically you know it's I think it's in two different dimensions uh, one is its digital intensity and, and the digital culture so you know so digital intensity intensity for example measures the the use of digital technologies in the company's operations that can include uh, for instance uh, the use of digital tools or the collection of the and use of the data to make decisions, uh, for example. So you know we do have this uh, this tool that will be able to 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 help uh, companies sort of assess you know where they're at. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if I didn't know and Julia wanted to address that as well in terms of um, you know maybe from the TCS perspective is some other ways that you know that the trade commissioner service in the EU can help companies prepare um, based on the competition. I'm not sure who wants to uh, address any of those those issues, uh, Julia or Adina. I think, I think my advice, and then I will go to, go to, to Julia actually, is to really contact the, the trade commissioner in the local market because they will be able to also provide an evaluation of the competition there. Uh, so really, again, um, just to insist, yeah, indeed, market research is very important, and uh, please leverage our network of trade commissioner. Again, I repeat, 25 offices that cover all the EU member states. States and, uh, and the UK. So here, don't hesitate to to contact them. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Go ahead, Julia. Did you want to go ahead? No, I just wanted to say nothing to add. Okay. Okay. Just um, I, we've got time for I think one more question here, um, and it's a logistics question. So you know, feel free uh, the, the three of you to weigh in uh, based on on. Uh, on your perspectives, once a product product gets into the EU market, uh, you know, Julia, you talked about the need for a German warehouse to service the German market. Um, uh, can that German warehouse service other markets in the EU? How freely can um, can product move once once it's in the EU? Well, as was mentioned before, it's a uh, it's a single market. So once it's inside the single market, it can move around freely. Goods and people. And that, that applies to all products. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, listen. Uh, thank you uh, to the three of you for your time today. Uh, thank you all for those who are online listening. Um, if you have any questions for us, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, to myself directly, or uh, even better, to your local trade commissioner where you live in Canada. A final point, you know. Uh, just to encourage Canadian companies to, to consider uh, e-commerce in the EU, um, it's clear that there are, uh, you know, there's a lot to know, there's a lot of regulation, but uh, I don't want to overemphasize the challenges uh, with the market, but rather um, I'd like to just, you know, end it on a note for, you know, the enormous opportunities that there are 
because you know the reality is I think even when you get your e-commerce strategy right, uh, I think even when you get the the, the marketing mix, uh, you know, for your your particular target market right, and you've got your logistics set up um, that works properly, you're always going to have to um, you know improve and adjust as you go, uh, as you would in any other market. Uh, the opportunities are huge. Again, thank you to the panelists, and um, I will throw it back. Thank you.